You just clicked on another episode of the Meaningful People podcast. This week we are sitting down. You know what you just did. You know what you did. And I hope you don't regret it. <laughs> I'm not going to regret it. We sat down with a Chase Taub. Rabbi Chase Taub. Wow. Wow is right. Like, what, a, what a tremendous yid. What a tremendous person doing incredible work. Really groundbreaking work in so many different areas of mental health and recovery and just spiritual work. And we delved into so many different parts of his life. Disclaimer, right in the beginning, you'll hear a, an amazing story about Michael Jordan and, sh- and a young Chase Taub. So uh, enjoy this episode. Um, if, if you have any feedback, you can always email us, meaningfulpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing your feedback. Um, or you could just text Momo, his <laughs> number over here. Um, but first, before we get this episode, of course, you can hear about Turo University later on in this episode. But our friends at Bridge Credit Solutions have Bridge a message. Bridge Credit Solutions. They have a message for you. Four proven steps. A guaranteed. It's guaranteed. Guaranteed. It is guaranteed. They have four steps. First step is they listen to your journey. They make a podcast with you. You have a chance to say <laughs> your journey, unpack your story. That's step one. Step two, they remove negatives from your report. You buy mistake, you missed a payment like Momo said last week, you didn't know you put an auto pay and there's a negative report in your credit, wipe that clean. Boom. Then they guarantee that they will boost your credit score. The legal way. The legal way. Correct. Correct. And then secure favorable long-term loans. Yep. Want to buy a house? You want to buy a building? You just need a loan? You need to have good credit, and you need to reach out to Bridge Credit Solutions. Maybe you want to buy a couple buildings. Maybe a few buildings, you know, just perusing online. You want to buy buildings. So go ahead and reach out to Bridge Credit Solutions. The link is in the show notes and in the YouTube description if you're watching on YouTube. Click that link. Send them a message on WhatsApp. and Send uh, who a message? Bridge. Bridge Credit <laughs> Solutions. And one more thing. Remember a few weeks ago, you may have heard about Machsheva Sechaskel on this platform. Well, you can search on any podcast platform, short Machsheva on the daf. It's given by Rabbi Yecheskel Hartman, uh, part of Mishka, uh, Machshav Yecheskel. If you're into daf yomi, if you do daf yomi, this is for you. Go ahead. It's a three to six minute daily Machshava on daf yomi. And uh, it's given by Rabbi Hartman. Rabbi Hartman is actually somebody who posts every single day on the Meaningful Minute app, different halachas. Highly, highly recommend it. Go check it out. Enjoy this episode, guys. You are listening to the Meaningful People podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. Okay, what an honor, what a pleasure to be sitting here with Rabbi Chase Taub. Finally, finally, you know, you, you don't live too far away, but we got you. We finally yeah. got you. So. Baruch Hashem, yeah. Thank welcome, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being here. It was on my list of things to do in oh, five towns. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm glad we at least made the list. Yeah. The Chamber of Commerce. It's yes. in the pamphlet. It's, it's in, in the, the pamphlet. Village, uh, Village of Cedar it is. pamphlet. It so really is. A, make it's sure a, to at least. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. That's good to know. I didn't know that. Is yeah. it though? So um, I want to jump right in. I heard a story. Okay. That involved a young Rabbi Chase Taub. Okay. And Michael Jordan. <laughs> this is how you want to start. This is how I want to start. Like. You can't beat that. Now, I, who else, a rabbi, has a story with Michael Jordan? I, I, there may be others. I Are there? I don't. I don't know. Let's there. hear. Let's let's hear what you, you want to hear. My Michael Jordan. I story. want to hear Michael Jordan. Yeah. First of all, I want to tell you something. This Michael Jordan story. It's so funny asking the Michael Jordans. Uh, yeah. Okay. Fine. I didn't tell this story for years, for one reason, because when it happened, um, nobody believed me, and I got tired of being laughed at and doubted so i just stopped telling it i didn't tell it for years and then what happened is my brother david my younger brother david he told it to a friend of ours and uh chaim marcus out in uh, yes chaim marcus in, in, in la who's the who's the brother of ellie marcus that's of that's, Day, who, and- that's who's guilty of i that's where i heard this from that's, <laughs> that's who's guilty like, but now we're gonna find so- out if it's truly a true story <laughs> so yeah so chaim uh yeah he He's the one who got me to talk about it publicly first. And I told him, I, said, I, I don't want to talk about it because no, nobody believed me for so, for so many years. But, okay, here's the story. Bottom yes, line is like this. Let's get okay. to it. Okay. So the Chicago Bulls, they used to have a practice facility at uh, the Multiplex in Deerfield. Mm-hmm. And uh, so one time, I was a kid. I was, I think I, I was, well, it was after Jordan broke his foot. So my, Jordan's rookie year, I was 10 years old. 
So this was after he came back. So I must have been 12. You grew up in Chicago, I grew presume. Grew up in Chicago. Yeah. Nice. That's why I say Chicago. 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 Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I dress like the Blues Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> represent from God. <laughs> so um, the, 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 the Bulls were like coming out of practice and everyone, all the kids were like mobbing Jordan because he was, you know, the big star even back then. And uh, so he was getting into his Corvette, his Air 23 license plate uh, Corvette. And all the other kids were running up and they're getting autographs. He was signing their autographs. And I was like the straggler in the back. And uh, I was like the last kid to try to get the autograph. And I I don't remember what I had. I mean, even maybe it was just you know, a scrap of paper. But I reached yeah. in like to the door. And I was like, hey, Michael, can I get your autograph? And he says to me, get your hands away from the car door or, the, or I'm going to slam your hands in the door. That is litigious. Were, yes. were, were those the exact words or were, were there a something little... like that? Get your hands away uh, or you, they're going to get slammed in the door. Something like that. Oh, man. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Michael Jordan said he's going to slam <laughs> his car door on my hands. That's a lot. That's right? a foul. And everyone else that did is, it. That's, it was terrible. That's flagrant. And, and, yeah. And, and <laughs> a flagrant foul. Excuse my, so, excuse my basketball <laughs> puns. I'm sorry. <laughs> that all the other kids got their autograph and I was like the last kid. So I was the one who got yelled at and get rejected. And so I, I came home. I told my father, I said, I hate Michael Jordan. He's so mean. He said he's going to slam. Now, he didn't really say, I'm going to slam my car door on your hands. He said something to the effect of, get your hands away from the door so I don't slam my door on your hands. That's not how I took it. I took it as absolute he was contempt. Gonna, he was going to sever your hand. Yeah, exactly. He, he was talking about natural consequences. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to teach you a hard lesson. That's how I took it. So I was, oh, I hate Michael Jordan. He heard about so, the Taubes. Yeah. He, he was going for you. <laughs> so my father, Zol um, he did the craziest thing, which I didn't even think of it as crazy until years later. He found out where Michael Jordan lived. He lived at that time. He, didn't, he hadn't even bought in a house. He hadn't even bought a house yet. Later on, he lived in Highland Park. He had a couple different houses in Highland Park. But he was living, I think it was in Northbrook. It was like near the corner of those people in Chicago, in Willow and Finkston, near Plaza del Prado. I don't even know if it's still there. But there was like a, a bunch of duplexes. The address is in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> someone is... Someone is <laughs> well, I don't think he's lived there for like 30 years. But at any rate, he had like a duplex in this uh, like uh, housing development near uh, the corner of Willow and Finkston. And for some reason... You know what? I don't remember the address. I, okay. At any rate, but my father found out where he lived and he wrote a letter and he didn't write the letter to like the bull's office. Cause then it's, you know, some secretary reads it and puts a rubber stamp letter and it's not Michael Jordan. He wanted Michael Jordan to read it. <laughs> so he writes to him and he's like, Michael, you hurt my kid's feelings. And I know you're too much of a class act to not make it right. Wow. Okay. So like a week later, my father comes over and he's like, you got a phone call. Get like, out of here. Right. So I'm like, okay, who's calling? And he's like, Michael Jordan. I'm like, no way. He's going <laughs> to sever my hand. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. <laughs> that was all forgotten at that point. Okay. That was just the, the I, all. Yeah. Of Michael Jordan's call. Wow. So he, he's like, yeah, yeah, Michael Jordan. I'm like, no way. And I grabbed the phone and he's like, hi, this is Michael Jordan. And it was. I, kept, I mean, I recognized his voice. Unmistakable. Voice. Unmistakable. Wow. Right. Okay. So he's like, this is Michael Jordan. And I'm like, hi. And he's like, listen, I just want to know something. Are you still my fan? Wow. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course I am. <laughs> he's like, when are you coming to a game next time? And we used to go to games once in a while. So I, I forget what I said. I think, it was, I think it was versus Denver. For some reason, that's what I think. Anyways, and he's, and he's like, okay, so listen. So after that game, you come down to the locker room. You wait for me. And I'm going to autograph anything you want. So yeah, and he did, and the autograph, and I had that Nike poster with the you know jumping over the skyline with the skyline wow. in the background, and uh, and he signed that, and so that was like an amazing story. And then I told all the kids, and they were like, "Nah, you're lying. Nah. It never happened." <laughs> Michael Jordan called you, right? Okay, but this is before screenshotting was an option. Exactly. So there was like no no proof, there was no evidence. There's no proof, right? Okay, so. It took me years before I realized that really, I mean, it was pretty cool, Michael Jordan, to do that. It is, it is pretty cool. 
but really it's a story about my father mm, yeah <laughs> really like that's 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 incredible it never even dawned on me that that was like above and beyond but i guess when i became a father i realized that these are the kinds of things you do for your kids wow and i was just in awe of what my father did for me because i for years i didn't even think of it as a story about him like yeah i knew that he was the one who got michael jordan to call me but it was like michael jordan's so awesome he took time to call me Oh, my father's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if your father knew, anticipated that Michael was going to follow up on it. And I know he was doing whatever he could right. for his son and to console you that this is what I did right. and he was going to tell you that. <laughs> but then Mike called. How realistic did he think it really was? Right. Yeah. I, I think probably he probably, I mean, I never asked him, but he probably had a plan like to follow up. I was going to say <laughs> that if, if you had said that a letter came back from michael jordan i right. my call was that your father would have your father forged the letter and right signed. right but the fact that it was a phone call right i thought you can't forge right. that and really. then i met him in person that yeah right. that that right. that's that, just that, that was real that's I unbelievable mean, but you really that wasn't it. a deep fake yeah and <laughs> it wasn't a deep fake but you <laughs> how are your father's impersonations are they any no no not, <laughs> no he doesn't my father has a john wayne impression he doesn't do a <laughs> Michael Jordan so, impression. so Rabitab, you have written a number of books. You you wrote yeah. for Ami Magazine for yeah. for eight pl eight plus years. Yeah. You've spoken all around the world. But I want to peel it back a little bit. Can yeah. you, I guess tell us a little bit about you know where you grew up um, and how your childhood was like. Okay, okay. So like I said, I grew up in Chicago. Chicago. Yeah, as a Bulls fan. Definitely Beer, Bulls the Bears. Fan. Uh, Bears, yeah, 1998. Uh, 90, I'm saying uh, 1985. That was the. Almost undefeated, one loss. They lost wow. to the Miami Dolphins. I've spoken about that with Chaim Marcus. He, he <laughs> grew up as a Dolphins fan. But uh, yeah, the one loss was to the Dolphins. And then they beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl in 85. Yeah, that was, uh, that was my big uh, Bears team. And the Cubs, of course. I don't think a lot of New Yorkers realize, but um, in Chicago, the Jews are all Cubs fans. G generally, nobody's a white. Nobody's a White Sox. Fan. No, the White Sox are kind of goyish. Really? Yeah. Well, there's some Yakis in Hyde Park who like because in the South Side. Yeah. But yeah, like Jackie I'm, Mason says, it's for Goyim and that's it. It's, so, <laughs> it, but it's a real cultural thing in Chicago. Like the, the Cubs are. You want to know something wild? Um, when the Lamavich Rebbe had his heart attack, there was a doctor, cardiologist, Rebbe, uh, doc, 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 doctor Ira Weiss from Chicago, who mm -hmm. flew in because he was a big expert. And then he became sort of like a family physician for the, for the Lubavitch Rebbe and Rebetzin. And he was a Cubs fan, still is a Cubs fan, Dr. Weiss. And Lubavitch Rebetzin, Rebetzin Chaim Moshka, used to, uh, when she would take calls from Dr. Weiss, she would ask him, how are your Cubs doing? <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> yeah, this That's is back special. in the 80s and the 90s, so it's like, that's nice. Not so well. Right. <laughs> Not so well. <laughs> well, it hasn't been well for most of the... Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I've mentioned this before. I mean, because uh, people, a lot of people ask me, like, oh, do you have, like, professional training? Do you... Are you a psychologist? Are you a therapist? And I, I always say, no, no, I'm not. But my father's a psychologist. My, uh -huh. my mother's a speech pathologist. And my father's a psychologist. And so I grew I grew up around the idea of like helping people and trying to have insight into people's struggles. And I think a lot of listeners would be surprised to learn that about I you. I know. No, people are surprised that all what? the time. I think a lot of listeners are surprised to learn that you don't have any formal clinical they training. They are surprised. Or... People are surprised all the time. People will argue with me. <laughs> no, they would. Uh -huh. No, but but you're a therapist, right? I'm like, no, I'm not a therapist. No, but you wrote a column. You're like, uh, I said, it, it's a Torah Hashkafa column. What, I, what's Listen, therapy? do you need to be a therapist to give therapy? I don't know. I mean, probably yes. <laughs> That's probably a dumb question. <laughs> probably a licensing issue. But yeah. I, you do have to be a Talmud Chacham to give Torah Hashkafa, <sighs> which you are, and and that's the vantage point that you've always come from. And that and 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 you you know when I started that column for Ami whole, for Ami Magazine, yeah, yeah the whole point was I wanted to show how Hashkafa, Toira Hashkafa is relevant and it speaks to our issues and contemporary issues and, and real things that human beings go through. And, you know, to a certain extent, I really struggle with the fact that, you know, people would come and give me these, these not, they, they don't intend to right. say what they're saying, but it's almost like, if somebody would come up to you and say, by the way, I really like the meal that your wife prepared, 
really was tasty. That was treif, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, chas v'shalom wasn't. No, because it was so good. I'm assuming you didn't limit yourself to kosher ingredients. Right. Like, that's such a sad statement. But people will say the same thing to me. They'll say, well, of course, that, that, that was based on secular ideas. And I'll say, I don't even know the secular ideas. I, 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 <laughs> so for those listening, your, your yeah. column for Ami magazine yeah. spanned over almost a decade. Yeah. It was Rabbi Tao answering people's questions. Yeah. Sort of like a mailbox. Yeah. Yeah. An advice column, they call it. And it was the weirdest thing. You know, Rabbi Yitzchak Frankfurter, who's uh, publisher and editor in chief of the Ami magazine, he, he didn't even know me. <laughs> He had never met me in person. He did an interview with me because I was in the New York Times for something that I had done in Omaha, Nebraska with Boys Town. Boys Town is a, an orphanage, originally a Catholic orphanage founded by a priest. And um, they brought me out there to speak to their clinical staff about the spirituality of recovery from addiction. Mm -hmm. And that, the New York Times heard about it, and they thought that was pretty novel, and they wrote it up. So Rabbi Frankfurter contacted me and said, could we do an interview? I said, sure, why not? So we did an interview. He did one interview with me, and he says he, he calls me the next week, and he says, we want you to be our advice columnist. So at that time, and, and still at this time as well, I had never read properly read an advice column. I, I mean, I've heard, I know what Ann Landers is. I know right. what, I, I mean, through cultural osmosis, I'm aware of the concept of an advice column, but I'd never read it. So I didn't really know what you do. So I said, I don't know what that is. Like, give me another genre, you know, <laughs> like, uh, like a serialized uh, story. I'll write like a drama or something. Yeah, like, <laughs> what, 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 what's a, an advice column? He says, you're, you're going to be good at it. figure it out. So I'll tell you what I did. I thought to myself, well, what, what, do you, what, what do you really do? People are going to write to you about their issues, and you have to have an answer. So I thought to myself, well, you know what that's like? The closest thing I could think of, it's like the Lubavitch Rebbe's Igres Kodesh. It's a whole set. Come to my house. We have an entire bookshelf that's just the Rebbe's photo, my modem and sikhas. And, but then there's one whole row that is the Igres. Igres literally, literally means the letters. Those are letters, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. It's not even all the letters, but the correspondences that the Lubavitch Rebbe was engaged in for decades. And you had, you had just you just started a podcast recently called The Rebbe's Letters. And I th that's true. Which I, is very popular. It was Baruch Hashem, and we're getting such great feedback. Yeah, that's but, like, by the way, yeah. Yeah, not that I look yeah. every single day, but it's like number 11 on the rankings. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not that I'm looking. Oh, yeah, it is? <laughs> yeah, it's up there. I don't know, number 11, but it's up there in the top 20. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you're doing good. You're doing good. Yeah, I think you took a clip from one of them. I, I think I did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, people are loving it. A lot of people don't even realize, especially Lubavitchers, they're like, well, are you going to learn the Rebbe's letters? Like, Let you it, learn yeah. a mimer, you learn a sikh, what, what are you going to learn? A, what, what, what is it? And I tell them, trust me, look at the le the letters have such depth. You got to read, read in between yeah. the lines. You know, you know, it's where the rubber hits the road. Because it's practical, because there's a real person writing and asking for real solutions. And... Look, everything in Toyota has an application if you're willing to put in the time to figure out how it's practical. When you're looking, though, at a letter that it ever wrote to a person who's facing a real issue, the practicality just jumps off the page. It's not even subtle. It's, it's not subtle. It's, it's not very, theoretical. It's so it's obvious. Abstract. So, And there's a whole mahalach. There's a, there's a certain approach how the Rebbe would deal with issues. And so... I mean, Frankfurter says, write an advice column. So I'm like, okay, I'll just imitate Igris Kodesh. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I just started like blatantly ripping it off. What do they say? Like uh, good writers borrow, great writers steal. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? You stole that thing. I just, just stole it. Or I, there's a similar saying, which is um, all wisdom is plagiarism. Only stupidity is original. <laughs> <laughs> so it was totally plagiarized. I ripped off the style. And it resonated with people. Uh, the yeah. Reb, I'm sure, is very, very proud of the plagiarism. I, I hope so, yeah. Because I think that was the Rebbe's intent, by the way. Not just in the Igris, but the way that... It, the, people don't realize the Rebbe's style of teaching. Um, it's, there's a certain derech halimud. See, a lot of people hear about the Rebbe in a lot of different contexts. You hear about the Rebbe as like a leader and an right. organizer. You hear about the shluchim. A lot of people don't realize about the... The Torah, 
like push it right. thousands of pages of real Torah. And there's a very distinct Dere Halimut. And if you're a Talmud, you learn not just what did the Rebbe say, it's how did the Rebbe say it? How did the Rebbe take something apart and put it back together? Like, so this doesn't sound so practical, but like a Rashi Sicha. The Rebbe mm -hmm. gave hundreds of Sichas where he take a Rashi on the Chumash and ask like 20 different questions, where at the end of the 20 questions, like, this Rashi doesn't make sense anymore. <laughs> and then the Rebbe would put it all back together in the, this. It's like this, surgery. Like surgery. And then it's like, it's, it's so elaborate and yet so simple. And it, it's a certain way of thinking. And is, I'm curious, Tyrus Chabad is, is a universe in and of itself. Yeah. Your, your training in Tyrus Chabad, was yeah. that from, from the start in, in Cheder? Or, or so was that So my parents became developed? Lubavitch. My parents are part of the Chabad community in uh, Rogers Park, you know, B'nai Ruvain. And but, but we came to it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't properly learn Chassidus until I was older. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'd been exposed to it, heard it there, here and there, but it was more like, on a superficial level, more right. like like a Chabad house level, and uh, and in fact, <laughs> I, I don't think I ever. You want a scoop? I want a scoop. Okay, I've, I've been never, waiting. I've never said 18 this. Eighteen minutes in, we got our first scoop. I almost left. <laughs> we have a scoop yeah. sound. I almost ran away from a Chabad yeshiva because I I, ne I never told this publicly before. There was a time where I felt very frustrated with Chassidus. I felt like I couldn't get it. It's too too abstract, and I wanted to go. I'm not going to say where, but I, there was a specific yeshiva I wanted to go to. It was a Litvish yeshiva where I felt that I could grow more. Really, in learning Gemara. Wow. Yeah, and it was like a it was a real struggle. Okay, but anyways, I stuck with. <laughs> oh, I stuck with the Chabad. So no, I didn't go. But oh, so it was, it was a half a scoop. Okay, <laughs> no, that's a big scoop. You know how much harassment I'm going to get in Crown Heights for this? Okay, <laughs> so we'll, you know, we'll send you a security detail maybe. <laughs> You, did, you did well by staying. <laughs> where you disclaimer: were. You, you're, you're a Chabad Chassid, and you're also a Shliach. I'm a Shliach. Yeah, Baruch Hashem. That's I'm very. So proud when did of that, when yeah. did your I guess your Shlichus with Chabad start? Okay. Well, I mean, you, you know, it's interesting. A lot of people who are business owners, the business that they run now, or even the business that they're most associated with, wasn't necessarily their first business. Right. I don't think a lot of people know this, but a lot of shluchim, they go on shluchis, and it takes a while. There's an adjustment process till you find your shluchis. So I, I think I finally found mine. I hope I found mine. And uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's, it's a very unusual shluchis. First of all, I like to tell people that almost all shluchim were sent out of New York. <laughs> I was right. sent to New York. <laughs> <laughs> That's special. I was, yeah. Are you are you by nature? You grew up in Chicago. Yeah. There's like this huge in town out of town debate. Yeah. Yeah. So are you? Do you consider yourself like an out of towner? Completely. I never adjusted to New York. And you live in the most in town place in the world right now. Yeah. Like Lafayette, relatively speaking, like Nassau County, right turn on red, is like in the tri state area. It's like almost civilization. It's almost. <laughs> right. It's almost like the Midwest. Almost. But yeah, New York. I never adjusted to New York. It's I'm not I'm not here by choice. I'm here because you're here for how many years how many years are you? Four here years for? now. Four years. Yeah. And so and specifically I'll tell you what's also unique about my Schlichis, which I really cherish. Not just that I got sent to New York instead of out of New York, but you know, most Schluchim are there for dealing with Jews who are assimilated or they are l lacking basic education and sort of bringing them into the fold. And specifically, the reason I was sent here is to work with the observant community, with people who are religious. And it's, I love it because- Wait, Were you a, were you a shliach anywhere else before you were sent to New York? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that? my first shlichus uh, was uh, in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. How old were you? What was that like? So you didn't grow up. I mean, like, I feel like this could be a-, a Stereotype? Yeah. You can call me out on it if it is. Okay. Do most shluchim come from houses of shluchim? Mm, by now, it's quite common. By now, but maybe not. been around for a while. Right. Yeah. Um, and maybe half and half. So your father wasn't a shluchim? No, you, you psychologist, became, professional. So what drove you to say, I want to get the shluchim? Was that like the cool thing or? That's a great question. That's my job. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like what drove me personally? Um, so, I mean, we, we spoke about the fact that I, I enjoy learning the Rebbe's Torah and yeah. 
more than I enjoy it. I find it deeply meaningful and it gives me direction in life. And here's here's my challenge. I'll give anyone a challenge. I challenge anyone to go and learn the Rebbe's Torah and take it seriously and tell me at the end, you don't also want to go on shlichus. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. That's what will happen. Just fair warning. <laughs> <laughs> might end up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <laughs> Who knows? I'm or not. in the five towns. Or in the five. Oh, that would be ironic. Yeah. Imagine that. Can you imagine? So, <laughs> so you had you had an experience in Milwaukee. Yeah. And uh, what was that like? What were the what was the community like? Baruch Hashem, nice little uh, out of town community. You know, Midwest, my speed. Um, and I started off doing regular bonus and adult education, but that's where my uh, I started the Jewish recovery meeting. That's where the whole thing, you know, it's one of the things I'm associated with, right. uh, with the, the recovery stuff. That started in Milwaukee. Um, Does that association come from your book, God of Our Understanding? Well, the book came from that. Okay. The book was the outgrowth of that. What happened is, okay, so I'm going to tell you something. I'm just be blunt. Yeah. Okay, rabbis have a certain agenda. You know, we want to talk about God. We want to talk about like... This sounds like a scoop. Right, okay. <laughs> no. Spirituality, the soul, deeper meaning. And, okay. And most people are like, yeah, yeah, good. You know, let's let's get to the cholent. Let's get to the, you know, yeah. okay. And I started finding these people who were really, really serious about spirituality. And then I discovered they all had something in common. They all had hit bottom and turned their life over to God as they understood. They weren't religious people. They weren't. I mean, they were Jews because mm-hmm. I, I, I would. I met Jews of all stripes and all walks of life, all ages, all economic uh, backgrounds. But they weren't religious. But they all were deeply spiritual, and and they would pray every day, and they would meditate, and they would always talk about God and I was like what is up what's going on here and and they would listen they would like yeah rabbi tell me more tell me more and I found out all these people are in recovery and once I discovered that world it was like I found my home it's like I found my home it's like I found like these are real people like and we started a group a uh, group of Jewish men who would get together, and it was it was a Torah class, but we called it a meeting, you know. Um, and that's the beginning of my association with the world of recovery. From there, what happened is uh, NPR came. Wow! And they did a story on it. That's big. You yeah. did a story on what exactly your meeting? Um, the meeting, yeah. They did a story about uh, the Jewish recovery meeting, yeah. So NPR came and they interviewed me and they were like, well, where's this going to go? Like, what are you going to do with this? Cause this is just like a little meeting in, in, in Milwaukee. Like how, how's this going to have legs to it? So I said, well, I'm writing a book. I want to tell you the truth. I wasn't writing a book, <laughs> 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 but I said on NPR, I'm, I'm, well, I'm writing a book. And then I was like, after I said, it, I was like, well, maybe they'll edit that part out. Yeah. <laughs> But they didn't. They made yeah. that part the pull quote. That, exactly. That <laughs> they was put like, it in the middle. They led right with that. So I was like, I got to write a book. <laughs> yeah. So I sat down. I started writing God of Our Understanding, or the book that became God, God of, of Our, Our Understanding, Understanding, which is a very, very well, well-known book. It's, it's, it's insane. Like everywhere I go in the world, literally anywhere I go in the world, till this day, the book came out 11 years ago. Right. People come to me till this day, anywhere I go. And, you know, if I see somebody quiet standing in the back, Mm-hmm. Like waiting the crowd, waiting for the crowd to disperse, and then patiently walk over to me, like really humble, really subtle. I know what they're gonna say. They're gonna but, say, yeah. "God of our understanding." You, you can know, see I, it coming. Yeah, I spoke to somebody before before I came to the office here, and I was talking about Rabbi Taub, talking about you, and that person told me point blank that there was a period of time that they were going through something very rough in their life, and they read that book, and it completely completely changed their life it changed their perspective on the struggle they were going through so i guess let's discuss briefly that book okay what you wrote uh yeah what what inspired you what what drove you in the let's for those who don't know the contents of it like, yeah well you know god of our understanding is basically um my attempt to describe a certain model of addiction 
and recovery. And when I say a certain model, there are many models and I'm, I have no dog in this fight as far mm -hmm. as saying there's one particular model. The one that the people that I met and, and felt a kinship with right. were people who all identified with a 12 step model of recovery, which uh, is a spiritual model. And in God of Our Understanding, I speak a lot about the, the spiritual model or the 12-step model of addiction and recovery. I speak about the history of it. That was very interesting because um, I had to dig up some archival material when I was teaching about the history of it. Um, a lot of people don't know that the origins of the spiritual model of, of addiction actually you know, AA got it from somewhere. One of the sources they got it from, when I say AA, I don't mean American Airlines, I mean yeah. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous, they got it from Carl Jung. There's a whole crazy story about the guy who met the guy who met the guy who started AA had been a patient of Carl Jung. Carl Jung was one of the great uh, fathers of modern uh, psychiatry. He and uh, Sigmund Freud. And actually Carl Jung had a split with Freud because <laughs> Jung insisted that spirituality was vital to mental health and faith and belief. And Jung was not Jewish. And Freud being Jewish, so interesting. he yep. couldn't afford to admit <laughs> that you need spirituality to be healthy, right? Which is the classic thing, you know, the, the, the Jews resist it so much. Like yeah. when, when we're a Bachem and we like stand on the, the corner, in the street corner in Manhattan, excuse me, sir, are you Jewish? We'd like to put on tefillin. So the guy who screams at you, get away from me. That's that the one Jew. Is, yep. <laughs> That's the the non-Jews always like, I'm so sorry. No, is there anything I can do for you? <laughs> no, you're good. You're beautiful. Just because God <laughs> made you. It's all good. But so Jung believed that spirituality was essential to mental health. He treated an alcoholic. He told him that you need to get a, a spiritual awakening. This alcoholic met a guy who met a guy who became the co-founder of AA. And they based their whole thing on that theory of Jung. And then there's this, there's, there's this letter that they wrote, Bill Wilson, who was the co-founder of AA, wrote to Carl Jung 20 years later. And it was one of the last letters that Carl Jung responded to before he passed away. Like literally, they waited 20 years before they told him and said, hey, by the way, you know that idea that you told this guy? He told it to a guy who told it to a guy, and now we did it for a million people, and it works, right? And they didn't think to tell him for 20 years. They told him and he wrote back and then a few months later he passed away. It was one of the last letters that he answered. Um, but in that letter, so I had seen that letter. You know, this is really before, I mean, the internet was around, but it was very primitive. So I'd seen like photocopies of that letter, the letter of Carl Jung to, to Bill Wilson. And, uh, but I was searching for it. I was trying to find, now you could just Google it. You could find it. But I wanted to get that letter. And I searched the, the archives of the estate of Jung, which is in, in Switzerland. But then they told me, no, they don't have it because the letter was written in English and only the German language stuff is in Switzerland. It's at Princeton University. You want the English stuff, you got to go to Princeton. So I had to go. I called this guy named Mike, I forget his last name, from the library at Princeton. I was like, oh, I need the Jung letter. And do you guys have it? He's like, yeah, we have it. So I'm like, great, give it to me. He's like, I don't have it. I'm like, you just told me you have it. He says, no, we have the rights to it. I said, what does it mean you have the rights to it, but you don't have it? He says, well, like if NFT, you man. find it and you yeah. print it, we're the ones who get to sue you for it. Oh, wow. <laughs> we don't have it. Later on, I found out where it is. It's up in Bedford, New York at a at a museum called Stepping Stones because the lady who runs it actually, after I was in the New York Times, she contacted me. She says, I have the letter. At any rate, there's this letter, this is what it's all leading up to, that I printed in God of Our Understanding, in fact, similarly of the letter that Carl Jung wrote. And he says this amazing thing there. Basically, he describes addiction and alcoholism as, as a spiritual condition, as a spiritual malady. And he says like this, the patient's craving for alcohol was a lower level manifestation of man's thirst for union with God. And then there's like an asterisk, and like at the bottom of the page, he writes in, I'm not in Hebrew, he writes in King oh. James English. No, he writes, <laughs> like, the, huh. like the deer is panting thirstily by the water brook, brook so does my soul thirst for you, oh God. Wow. You know, you know, from the Pusik, from Tillam, from, from Dovna Malach. So basically, what did he say? He said that here's a person, what do they really want? They want oneness. They want to just 
be absorbed in the all. They don't want to be a separate something. They don't want to be alone with their own ego. They want to just... No, this sounds very lofty. It sounds like, who, 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 are you talking about some tzaddik? You're talking about, you know, some, some, you know, really, really holy person. Um, well, I'm, no, I'm talking about an addict. I'm talking about an alcoholic who's uncomfortable in their own skin, who's existentially uncomfortable and, and needs to blot out the sense of self, to erase the sense of self in order to be comfortable. But what Jung was saying is that attempt to destroy the ego, to destroy the self was really like, this misguided attempt to achieve what they're really looking for, which is not to destroy yourself, but to transcend yourself, to rise above the ego and to lose that separateness and, and, and to be at one, mm -hmm. to be at one with, with the oneness, with a, with a capital O, oneness. So that, the, the book, Out of Our Understanding, is basically a lot of people are surprised when they look at it and they, they get back to me and they say, this is all chassidus. It's like all spiritual stuff. And I say, yeah, that's all it is. Right. That's all it is. So you, you found a, a way to infuse uh, Yiddishkeit, the Torah, chassidus into recovery. Yeah, and I wouldn't even call it infusing it because I saw it all there already. It just needed to be translated. That's all I did. I just said it in our language. Yeah, piece right. of cake, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds simple. It was though. It was for, for me. Once the, once it clicked for me, it was so obvious. We will be right back to this episode with Rabbi Chase Taub. Right back. But first, our friends at Turo University. You no, know, Turo has an alumna. Her name is Esti Esti Marcus. She's a social worker. She's making a difference in this world, being a social worker. But and why did she choose choose Turo? Well, besides the fact that Turo is building this new program and they're committed to excellence in that in that field, Turo understood her values and they. You know, and, 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 you know, what it means to be a firm Jew. She did not feel like an exception or an other in that school. And that's one of the advantages of being in Turo. Besides for the, the educational excellence that they offer and, you know, the, the help that the professors give you and the faculty give you, you won't feel like an outcast. No, they really cater to it. They do. Yeah. The Graduate School of Social Work, there are so many different ways that students can get their degree, their credential. They can do it on campus. They can do it remotely. There are hybrid programs. They can get it. They can take classes during the day. They can take classes in the evening. Um, there are separate classes for men and women. If people are more comfortable with that, you can do it in a consolidated fashion over the course of 18 months. You can right. spread it out depending on your lifestyle. And maybe you're already working somewhere and you need to do it over three years. You can do it that way. People are coming straight out of college. People are getting this degree as a second career. And some people are, yeah, like they're 43 years old and like, hey, I want to go into social work. I want to go ahead and get that degree. What do I do? The first step you should take is go to turo.edu forward slash more because there's more for you at Turo. There is. And there's so many different ways that students are applying. Graduates are applying this credential. They're working in private practice. They're working in mental health clinics. They're working in agencies. And they are really making a difference. And they're making a difference because of our friends at Turo. So go ahead, visit turo.edu forward slash more. And hey, you never know where that might take you. Back to this episode. Is there an element of reconciliation as well? I imagine people who grow up with Yiddishkeit, with a certain yeah. faith, and then they encounter this challenge of addiction. Yeah. I imagine it's a difficult it's a difficult thing for them to take on the twelve steps and, and this embrace this ideology yeah. without being confident that it's reconciled and it's perfectly consistent yeah. with the Torah. Right. And that was one of the things that I had in mind when I was writing it, that anybody who, you know, J Jewish people who have concerns, theological concerns, that this would not be compatible with their spirituality as Jews, I wanted to allay those concerns. And by the way, for that, that was not my Hiddish. I, mean, I was on, on the shoulders of Rabbi Dr. Torsky, all of a shalom. Right. He was the one, he was the pioneer who came out decades before I even heard of recovery. And he was the one who illustrated how there's nothing antithetical or to the contrary. It's, uh, it, from recovery, it's only, it only supports your Jewish observance and, and your faith, and it'll make you a better Jew. And he's brought out overtly the Torah and the 12 steps yeah. in, in multiple yeah. books. Have you found, since, since this work of yours, have you found that the Olam HaYeshivas have sort of accepted and embraced this consistency, that it's okay to embrace the 12 step program and the principles of, of spirituality because they're not inconsistent with the Torah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's, 
it's it's a cultural change and i've i've seen it i've watched it it's there's a shift and baruch hashem there's far less stigma today and far less you know amol there could almost be more stigma being in recovery than being an addict mm-hmm. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. like <laughs> somebody was just telling me the other day that he knew a guy, a Jewish guy from guy who was a drunk. And everyone knew he was a drunk because every Shabbos they saw him collapsing. And then he went to recovery. And then he was told that he shouldn't be part of the carpool anymore because they don't want someone like him driving carpool. Right. Make, yeah. So he said, he was like, he was totally blown away because he said, it's so funny. Every, when everyone knew I was a drunk, I was okay to drive their kids. <laughs> <laughs> now that I'm doing something about it, you know. That's deep, no? Yeah. Yeah, but I hope that that's slowly becoming the, the a outlier. Thing of the past, yeah. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, it's definitely changing and shifting. Slowly? Yeah. Yeah, well, look, social change can take generations. So something that you can observe within a lifetime is it's not that slow. I think it's... Baruch Hashem, it's, it's pretty steady. And uh, look, I'll tell you something more than that. Set aside recovery. I think an openness to spiritual growth and to searching in general is more accepted and regarded with more um respect today mm-hmm. that in the from world i'm saying i'm just so i'm speaking to to our community mm-hmm. uh than in the past i mean in the past there was sort of like a suspicion of anybody who was you know what are right. you doing? like what are you a hippie like what, what are you meditating like <laughs> like you know like let's keep it simple don't don't none of that fancy stuff right and i think what happened is similar to what happens in recovery where a person doesn't have the luxury anymore <laughs> to be so picky. They get to a point. Nobody joins a 12-step program because they're looking for spirituality. Right. That's, that's, nobody attends their first meeting and says, I heard this is where to find God. <laughs> that's not what happens. They have the worst day of their life. They have the worst day of their life. And they have no choice anymore. And they have to walk into that first meeting. And, and I think a similar thing has happened on a cultural level, on a societal level, that you know we get to a point where not nourishing our soul and not looking for deeper meaning and spirituality becomes it it's that it starts to take such a toll Mm -hmm. and starts to do real damage that we don't have the luxury or for many of us we no longer have the luxury to uh to say well that's not for me It's Mm -hmm. it's like suffocating and you 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 see it the the it's suffocating a a a a, a pressure a um a there's like this you know i think did we do a thing together meaningful minute after uh last year in the springtime we did a live potentially yeah on instagram yeah 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 i remember that and and we had some really beautiful feedback Somebody sent in some feedback. You sent it to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I was speaking about what happened, Lagbeimer. And, yes. Yeah. And I was talking about trying to, to learn something from people literally being crushed. Yeah, my own. Yeah. And I, I, I said something about, you know, sometimes the crushing is an emotional crushing where we crush each other and uh, we crush each other with, with expectations and with stigma and with shame. And I think I've seen it. I have seen it. There's, there's a change where people have made a decision that, you know what? I'm, I'm already different. <laughs> you know, I'm already not fitting in. Okay. So why continue being miserable? I'm right. not fitting in anyway. Okay. Trying to pretend to be whatever normal, quote unquote, normal is supposed to be, isn't working anyway. So let me get help. 
So yeah, well, I wouldn't even call it getting help because it, that makes it almost sound like uh, like there's something defective about me. I need help. Let's just say, isn't that sad that that what? that term alone makes it sound like there's something defective? Yeah, who doesn't it, need help? I know. I agree with you. I think it is sad, but I, I think you have to be also careful that we have to be honest where where we're at as a society, as a society, how far we have progressed, and I think it, it, it's more helpful to say like this look you're a religious jew you believe in god <clears throat> you believe god is infinite you believe that you're finite i'm assuming all this stuff is a given i don't care which background you come from, which yeshiva you learn which community you're from like these are basics you okay so you believe in god you believe he's infinite and all, all powerful and unlimited you believe you're a creation you're limited you're not all powerful okay so then it's a given that at some point <laughs> your own human power is going to fail you and you're going to need a power greater than yourself. Right. Okay? So that should be basic Judaism. That should be basic Judaism. But uh, for whatever reason, it's something that we're having to learn. But the, the, the shift has, has, has already begun, and I see it all the time. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go, there are pockets of people who are really sincerely searching and and almost always these are people who have some brokenness in their right. story you know and i've i've told this to, you, know, you know my typical gig you know let's say you know if i go you know speaking engagement it's a shul or a dinner or whatever you know just a regular thing but also quite often i'll be asked to go with with a group you know a group that will have their once a year Get together, yeah. Get together. And and these groups, generally speaking, are 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 niche or special interest and they're united about a certain issue, which is generally something that we would consider to be a struggle. I, I think objectively speaking, a struggle. Whether it's people who are facing infer infertility or it's people who are um, have a have a have a close relative who's incarcerated, or I'm just thinking of the groups where I've spoken yeah. and I've spent Shabbos with them and I've I've Mm -hmm. Spent time with these families and these people, or uh, people who have a serious illness in the family, um, or uh, people, uh, you know, God forbid, they experience the death of a child. You know, these clubs that nobody wants to be in, mm -hmm. right? But it sounds patronizing to say it, and I want to be careful how I say it, but go find the people who have been through real stuff. And you're going to find people, and with, and with the recovery people, and the people who've hit bottom because because they were brought to their knees by, by, the slavery of, of of addiction. Okay, I'll include them as well. But go find the people who have really experienced what it means that your own human power is not enough, and that the idea that only Hashem is in control and we're not is just so inescapably true and it's unavoidable. True. Like there's where you're going to find people who are humble and spiritual and, and who are seeking. And uh, I'll tell you what I always, I always make sure to say when I'm speaking to, to such groups, because generally speaking, I'm, I'm, I'm told usually by the organizers, like give them chizuk, they're very mm -hmm. down, give them chizuk, lift them up, they're, they have a hard life, give them chizuk. And you know, for that, my personal opinion, I don't know, maybe I won't get any more gigs, but I think that's what the badchen is for. And they usually mm -hmm. do, they'll have a badchen or something. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> last gig I had, they had Mendy Pell in there, it was, he was cracking <clears throat> he jokes. Job. And then yeah, that's, that's his job. So, uh, but I don't think my job is, to make people feel better. Actually, what I tell people who've been through real serious stuff is, look, you paid the price of admission. Ein chochem kebal nesoyen. That's what Chazal say. That if you've been through stuff, you become wise. The, the community needs you. You are the wise people of our community. And you think or... that, 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 that it's the rabbi or the educators. Okay, sometimes, some, sometimes, yeah. But Lavdavka, where is the real wisdom coming from? It's coming from the people who have been through pain and have come out the other side. And maybe don't have it all figured out yet, but they're figuring it out. Right. And 
these are the voices that we need to hear more of. Now, I, sp- I had spent Shabbos with an organization called Kesher Nafshi, and you were there Thursday night. You had a keynote session, which That's was incredible. Right, yeah. And just to the point that, that you're making, yeah. I'm, I'm happy that I, I have the opportunity to even like give them a shout out. What Gadalia Miller built or mm-hmm. Shimon Russell, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's unbelievable. I sent the Shabbos with over 500 parents who have kids who are who are you know severely struggling, severely, severely struggling, yeah, right? Not just not religious, not, not but just serious right. crisis. Uh, yeah, like some some pikuach nefesh, serious yeah. serious situations. Yeah. And my wife and I got to spend Shabbos there, and just the what just was your experience? Angels mm-hmm. walking. These are angels. These parents mm-hmm. are. And I, I, did, I had moderated a session with Rabbi Daniel Kalish, Rabbi Pinchas Young, mm-hmm. and Rabbi Rabbi Yossi Ben Shushan. I remember just ending off my session saying, like, it was at the end of Shabbos. The people there have inspired me so much mm-hmm. in terms of what it means to be a parent. That's right. To be a parent. Yeah. And these people right. might look at themselves as failures because they have children who have are struggling mm-hmm. in the worst possible way. And but they are the heroes That's for right. any parent. That's right. And I know and I've seen parents there who I who I'd known. I didn't know they were going through mm-hmm. that. I didn't know they were struggling. And I told them, I said, you're, you're the hero and my only wish that like i could have as a parent is to be the half the parent that you are mm-hmm. that's uh, yeah, that's right and we need to collectively learn from you know it's 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 nice to to, to let somebody know oh, you're great you're you're here i look up to you but ha- we have to go even more than that i agree with you i'm saying yes and even yes. more we have to listen ain chacham kabal nesoyin listen to a chacham this person knows what it's like to have Leilenu, you know, real crisis parenting, and to be able to do it with grace and and with a sense of humor, and and with betochen, these and, are the people who need and, to yeah. be teaching the community. And the, and these are people who leave all their baggage and their pride at the door because they are there and they are saying, "I need to work on this." Right. In right. that in that hyper focused right. example, those yeah. are parents that are saying. I want to do better for my kids. Right. They and don't every- have the luxury to pretend to be normal. Right. And that's the thing. Everyone's going to pretend to be normal as long as they can get away with it. But it's it's the worst. It's the biggest disservice. I think Abba Ibn, the uh, Israeli diplomat, said that nations, he was speaking about diplomacy because he was a diplomat. He said he was an ambassador. He said, nations are like people. They tend to behave rationally after they've exhausted all other options. <laughs> so... If I can keep up appearances, I can pretend I'm quote unquote normal. Yeah. Even if I'm dying inside, right? I'm going to keep that up, right? But I think what happens is when something just comes in and breaks you and you have to just acknowledge like, I'm so powerless. I can't, I don't run the world. I don't. That, that bottom, bottoming out experience, which sometimes we call it, you know, that, the, that humility that it, that it causes where you don't have the luxury anymore. It's like, I don't have the luxury. I like I have to be teachable. I have to be ready to learn. Okay. But the next step, and this is what I take a lot of pleasure in being part of facilitating. The next step is okay, those people were broken to the point of humility, to the point of becoming teachable, but now they need to become the teachers. Mm. And these need to be yeah. the recognized leaders of our community. It's not enough to say, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in all of you. I look up to you. No, let's put our money where our mouth is. Let's make these people who have been through crisis the recognized leaders of our community. That's a scoop. That, oh, deserves, that's a scoop? that deserves a standing ovation <laughs> because that's a big chiddish. I think it is a chiddish. Because people might look at those people as, oh, they, don't, they can't really discuss this because look what they're going through. Right. But it's, yeah, you're saying it's, it's the exact opposite. Wow. Right. That these are the people who should be giving hadrocha. And by the way, these are the same people who run away from giving hadrocha. Who, me? Little yeah. old me? What do I know? Look how messed up I am. That's the paradigm of the wounded healer. The people who are doing the most good are the people who've experienced the most hurt. It's always true, by the way. Wow. And I want to tell you something. If you know somebody who's empathetic and who's helpful and compassionate, it's none, it's none of your business what happened to them but I promise you something happened to them. Mm-hmm. How did they get that way if not? Wow. Sure. Shifting for a moment away from, you mentioned that when someone struggles with addiction, they have the worst day of their life and they find themselves in a yeah. meeting. For someone maybe that's not per right. se struggling with addiction, but they do want to develop their spiritual skills and yeah. their spiritual development, 
in a way that they feel crushed. Yeah. They don't have a meeting to go to. Right. But they still want to avail themselves of the Chachma Satayra that has all of this rich right. spirituality. Where do they go? Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah. It's, you know, you, you know. remind me of something that uh, one time you're asking, like, where do they go? Where, where, <laughs> where, where do they go? Like, is there a place? Where can I go? Guy, they go to an open meeting, but right, otherwise. Right, you can go to an open meeting. Right. So a guy came to me seething angry from guy and he was so angry he says to me he comes over and he's seething and he says i found god and my relationship with god is the most important fact of my life he says i grew up from went to yeshiva never cared about god but now he says my life fell apart i hit bottom I went into the rooms got into recovery and now life to me is nothing but how can i be of service to god and my life has changed. I'm like, so why are you so angry? Like, what are you? <laughs> he says, because how come I had to go find it at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? Why couldn't I find it in one shul? Tell me, where, where are they doing this in any shul? So, first of all, I, I heard his complaint. It's, wow. a, it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate complaint. So... Uh, I said, it's a legitimate complaint, but I said, it's not really fair. It's not a fair comparison because you have to understand something. You went to the rooms of recovery and you sat among people who know for a fact that they are powerless and have no choice. They no longer have the luxury to not completely surrender. Their life experience Cause it, it, prove cause that to them. There's no choice. This is it. This is where, and if they weren't at that point yet, they wouldn't be in that room. They only got to that point because of, you know, crushing experiences. And so they're ready. They're ready. And they're earnest and they're teachable and they're humble. Mm -hmm. I said, it's not fair. They're in a life and death situation. You're going to compare that to a bunch of quote unquote regular normal people for whom spirituality is a bonus. It's not life and death. It's a, it's an enhancement. It's a, a way of making life better, nicer, more meaningful. So pulling that thread is, is the strategy to make, to create urgency around spirituality? Yes, 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 yes. We have to create urgency around spirituality. Spirituality is not a luxury. That's one of the things I think maybe could use some clarifying because yeah. there's a there's a kind of a, a debate and i don't want to get into the debate and i don't want to name names and uh, you know no let's name names i'm getting <laughs> kidding <Okay. laughs> scoop craving notwithstanding anytime someone says i don't want to name names i just like <laughs> my my brain is like don't do it don't do it <laughs> let's say names so you're okay it, it, it's not specific names i mean oh, you don't have to say names. Okay. no i'm not you, you don't I'm the guy that empowers you to not say anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's me here. Devil, <laughs> angel. Yeah. You know? Everyone will be able to fill in their own names for this, okay? Mm -hmm. Because it's not just one person on one side, one person on the other side. There are many, many people representing various different iterations of this dichotomy. Mm -hmm. But basically the dichotomy, and it's, it's, it expresses itself in many different ways in, in the community. I mean, the larger from community. And that is sort of the, the debate about how necessary uh, spiritual, mystical practices, spiritual seeking is. Mm -hmm. Um, why isn't it enough just to have halacha and we ha we can learn gemara and like why do you have to go for extra for more right and and like there's this debate raging and I'm standing on the side I never take part in those debates and I'm just like watching it and I'm thinking to myself well if it's seen as an extra if it's seen as a bonus or an enhancement you got a great point like what do you need it for but to me the whole premise is flawed it's not a bonus it's life and death it's life and death the only thing is there are very few people who are at that point 
point where they can recognize it as such. Mm. You ask the people who've been broken by whatever whatever it is, whether it was addiction or whether it's a struggle with infertility or with a child who's in crisis or with with a family member who's in prison or you know any of these things or the loss of a of a child. All these these examples of just these breaking experiences or even day to day anxiety. Well, here's the thing. We need to start to widen that circle of unmanageability mm -hmm. and admitting that we need God. <laughs> There's Period. no shame in saying that we need God. So, yeah, we're just... Should like we get a bumper, said, bumper sticker? What? What's the bumper sticker? We need be? God. We need God. We need yeah. Hashem. Yeah, that's good. I like it. Thank you, Hashem, she got on yeah. that. We need Hashem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's patent it first before you, <laughs> before you release the yeah. podcast. But... So somebody has regular day-to-day -day anxiety, let's say. And let's say it's not even to the point where it's, it's diagnosable or, or, you know, it's just, it makes life more difficult. Can we get that person to realize that spirituality and seeking oneness with Hashem is not just something you do for a recreation or a spiritual high, but that that is... It's not just for Kugel and Chant. It's exactly. That's right. It's that's the, right. It's it's everything. It's everything. It's the Iker. It's the Iker. It is the Iker. That's right. Yeah. And going back to what I was saying before about the people who need to step up and become the yeah. leading voices in our community, it's those people who can give us a healthy model for what that looks like. Because all those people are spiritual by necessity. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they'll tell you they're not even spiritual. I'm not even spiritual. But like they don't even realize what no. they had to go through to get to where they were. They That's went right. through it. That's right. And that's, it's happening already. It's mm -hmm. happening already. There is a shift. I mean, I've seen it. I've, I've been all over the world, seen different Speaking of shifts, yeah. I want to, you know, it's crazy yeah. how an hour almost has gone by in this yeah. conversation and we have a lot more to get to. Speaking of shifts, you you travel the world yeah quite often yeah a lot yeah and recovery and addiction is not the only thing you speak about i've been by Rarely. many of your right yeah. i've been by many of your your speeches and, and your talks in different places what, yeah. so what's what's that like you know just traveling the world as a, as a rabbi as a lecturer as a yeah. speaker what's that? do you get nervous still before you speak yes i do you get nervous I, uh, every time it's how it, many times you if you could it's the number a, one fear Public yeah. speaking is the Public number speaking. one yeah. fear. That's right. Death is number two. Right. That means if you have to be at a funeral, <laughs> you'd rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. <laughs> That's right. I, see, I'm I'm scared of speaking. Yeah. I'm I, but I think I'd rather be alive. I think <laughs> they they should like redo that survey. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know. Uh -huh. So you get nervous if you could Every ballpark time. like the amount of times that you've spoken publicly. Thousands. Thousands. Give Five thousand. Well, I mean, I've been doing it professionally you know for 15 years and there were there were times especially before corona where i would be speaking easily two three times a week so that's and i'm not even talking about classes i'm right. talking about like going and you know giving lectures so there are definitely years where i was doing it 150 times a, a, a year a good 10 10 of those years. yeah it's got to be like 2000 3000 wow know. and you still get nervous and i get nervous every time so you must be like nervous always <laughs> That's a lot of time. Yeah, being very nervous. often. Yeah, yeah. I have brief respites of non nervousness <laughs> between speaking gigs. Yeah, that must be exhausting. No, but it is. Yeah, it is exhausting. It, it is. Yeah, it's 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 depleting. Um, I don't enjoy it. You don't enjoy speaking, or you don't enjoy the nerves. No, I don't. I know. I don't enjoy speaking. I don't. I. You don't enjoy, it, but you love it. That's an interesting distinction. What's the difference? You know. Um, I did a podcast with Benny Friedman and yeah. I've repeated this a number of times. Yeah. It said about people who sing, right? Yeah. People who get into the right. Jewish music industry, right? How he says it's a crazy industry to get into yeah. just, just the fabric of it. It's just right. nuts, but he needs, he just, he needs to, because right. his soul is right. music. Yes. So it's something that yeah. he said, who should get into the music industry is the people who can't not sing. Right. And right. guys don't, rip, don't like, think i said the people who can't sing you need to be able to sing <laughs> yeah, the, but the, the people who just they can't they the person can't sit by a desk right. by nine to five they need right. to be singing right so they don't like it they just need to be doing it right Ex wow benny said that he said some of that something like that you you dressed it up <laughs> it's an adaptation but that's beautiful that's and it's it, yeah it's true I mean, who says it's fun it's not fun but 
is what, what's what I got to do. It's what I got to do. That's the avoda. Yeah. What do you That's do it. when your when your body like you just get up there? Hates get up what there. your soul needs. Wow, that's so deep. I, I don't know <laughs> what I, I don't know what I drank so before deep. this. I am like <laughs> very deep. <laughs> Should have gone to the mikvah before this one. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You, you know, I tell people it's yeah. like it, it, maybe it's not a good muscle, but uh, this is the muscle. It's like it's like a like a surgeon. Like even if a surgeon a surgeon does surgery, you know, thousands of times. Yeah. But you know, you're opening up a human being. It's life and death, right? So how could you not be nervous? You want it. You want a surgeon who walks in and is like, "Yeah, throw me the scalpel." Yeah. Like, <laughs> and that's the way I feel about. See, you have to understand. I'm not nervous because, like, I'm afraid I'm going to be judged. Like, how's that different than you know walking down the street and right. being judged? I'm nervous because it's surgery. Mm -hmm. Because people are listening and you're messing with their minds you're, and they're expecting a result. And no. Sometimes, yeah, there's pressure that they're, but some people are not even expecting. Sometimes a lot of time, you know, they're, they're skeptical. They don't even think anything's going to happen. Right. So it's not so much the pressure. It's more like the, the responsibility. Like people are listening. People are incurring reliance costs on what you're saying. That's correct. And you don't know how seriously they're going to take mm -hmm. you. And they might even like, here's something you said and actually go be crazy enough yeah. to do it. I think uh, one of the Marcus brothers shared on their on their episode that their father became from because a shliach in California told him he should be from just mentioned it. and yeah, yeah and like it was just you know a suggestion that he took <laughs> yeah. and it wasn't like a whole lot right. there yeah. but the, and then the family came from and like like you said there's gravity to what you're saying when you. people yeah. are and listening we, and we got you Lily yeah <laughs> <laughs> without that like where would Jewish music videos be today just That's a really right. good suggestion that yeah. they yeah. have made yeah. But so you speak a lot. You, yeah. you do it. What are what are some topics that you generally speak you about? Know, the truth is, yeah. okay. Since no one's listening, we'll just <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, just right. like our families. once we're here, <laughs> Momo's family, my family. Yeah. And I only kids. speak about one topic. Right. It's only one topic. It, it's it's spirituality. It's about a relationship mm -hmm. with Hashem. But then it's like, well, w w what title do we have to give it for marketing purposes? Right. So sometimes we call it Chinuch. <laughs> We call it shalom bias, or we call it happiness. Yeah, whatever we have to call gotta it. Gotta get people in the door. You know? Yeah, you gotta get them in the door, and you gotta have like a. a way you have to, to have like a provocative it, yeah, title. A hook. You gotta, you gotta have have the hook. gateways yeah. for for like a yeah. yantif, like the name of some of the speeches, like Rav Gav speeches, are like the cat that ate the fish. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to be in that what conference happened? room when they're giving the names of the lectures. Was Hashem from? Yeah, but you know what? It's, <laughs> you know, you have to understand their point of view. It's yeah. like chocolate cake or the speech how are we getting them from the tea room to the speech yeah so they got to give it a name you want to know something crazy there, there's a shliach who this is 20 30 years ago he made a shvuas night program and he came up with the slickest titles like the most provocative you know like yeah. you know like whatever titles and uh the Kabbalah of cheesecake or whatever it was <laughs> to go on yeah i'm gonna use that one <laughs> i love or that like, share that was a great share <laughs> oh yeah that's classic yeah. yeah or like you know current events and politics and celebrities names and you know whatever he had to do like make it really really uh enticing and he put out an ad in the paper and nobody came Mm. So afterwards, after Shavuos, after Yom Tov, he asked one of his Malabatim, the Shliach, a Chabad house. He's like, where were they? Everyone was going. Even the regulars didn't show up. And I, I made such enticing topics. He's like, oh, well, everybody went to uh, the Jewish renewal because Zalman Shechter was in town. Zalman Shechter from Jewish renewal. Okay. And he's like, he was in town. Yeah, well, what did he do? He did a program for, Shru for Shavuos. What was it called? Well, here's the flyer. You looked at it. Tikkun Leil Shavuot <laughs> with nice. Reb Zalman. That's awesome. What's the what's the what's the, what's the lesson? <laughs> what's the lesson? Yeah. It's like we try to be so enticing and exciting and 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 out of the box. Like by the way, this the Shabbos, you, yeah. I'm 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 speaking in Crown Heights this Shabbos, and. Uh, which is a place where I, I I lived in Crown Heights. Well, when now I'm married, I was being first. being what you said on this episode about you almost ran away from Chabad Yeshiva. I think. Yeah, now you understand. You, you're supposed. I want to confirm that engagement. Yeah. You're supposed to be <laughs> oh, speaking. Maybe I, I, 
<laughs> I didn't check my texts yet. But they asked me for a title. They were like, what should we call it? I said, Shabbos Hagodol Drasha. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy's like, I like that. It's actually good. It's like, yeah. like, like that. Confuse with the sun. <laughs> You know, <laughs> throw him off my trail, right? Yeah, yeah. Tanya, yeah, Tanya is a is a. Momo, you ever you ever learned Tanya? I have learned a little bit of time yeah. Tanya. Tanya is deep. in North Woodmere. There's a yes. Tanya Chabura. Yes. Shout out, shout there out. There was North an original Woodmere. original Tanya printing. Yeah, OG. Yeah, it's big Indian to to print Tanya wherever mm-hmm. it's learned. Yeah. And a very close friend of mine, Rabbi Yossi Schwartz, started a Tanya Chabura yeah. in North Woodmere, and someone contacted him that. Decades ago, they printed. I want to say in the forties, they printed a Tanya in North Woodmere. Really? Yeah. Yossi what? will fact check me in the forties. Okay. That's what like year it was? Robertson Young Race. Was yeah, there? very, very, wow. very be. early on. Wow. Wow. So, so for, for the for the layman, yeah, who doesn't know the uninitiated. Yes, what Tanya is? What is Tanya? What's the importance of of learning it? You made a map of it. I made the map of Tanya. Yeah, yeah. it was like one of the first like projects what, what, I did. What is Tanya? Yeah. Well, Tanya's a book. Tanya's a book. That's a good yeah. start. But it's a different kind of a book. In fact, in the Hagdama Samalakit, in the author's introduction, actually, he doesn't even call himself the author. He calls himself the Malakit, the compiler. Because he says, I'm just compiling the wisdom that I was taught. Right. And I'm just organizing it. I'm just the, just the organizer. And... Uh, in this forward to the book, so the Balatanya, you know the Balatanya wrote the Tanya. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they call it the Tanya. Yeah. And because he was the Balatanya. So when he wrote a safer, they said Nice. Tanya. Of course. It works. Yeah. So uh the Chafetz Chaim. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> of course he called the book Chafetz Chaim because his name was Chafetz Chaim. So of course he, exactly. I didn't know that version of the joke, but yeah. We can use that. That's the, that's how they say it in Lita. Uh now I doubled yeah, my repertoire. I have yeah, the same yeah. joke, but two versions of it. So the 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 Alter, we call him the Alter Rebbe. Um he writes in the in the introduction that the purpose of this book is actually to simulate the experience of Yechidas. Yechidas means a one-on-one audience. So basically he says that this book is like having a personal trainer, a spiritual personal trainer, and that everything you need is here. It's practical guidance. And if you can't figure out how to find your own tailor-made spiritual program in the book, consult your local teachers and they'll guide you. So it's an interesting book in that, yeah, it's very mystical, it's very deep, very spiritual, but it's so practical. It's 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 a manual, right? It's a manual. It's a user's manual for the soul, and it's just telling you how to manage this crazy condition called the embodiment of a neshama. Hmm. You take a chelik elakami mal mamish, right? Ah, you said the ma- ah. you're you. <laughs> That's how you, that's how you out the ah. Ah. Remember, honor yeah. 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 You say mamish, ah, nailed, right? Okay, because in pedic base, I just came out. I just came out. So he says mamish. Here's a scoop. Yeah. And uh, specify what you came out of. As the like, okay. What's the deal with a soul, which is a which is a you know, piece of godliness from above, in a body, and like you have this temptation and distractions and confusion it's like how do you deal with it and and what's the goal even like what what's where are the goalposts what what's the definition of doing well right and it's it's a book that i think brings a lot of comfort to people a lot of clarity um a lot of insight into our own nature and our own condition and at the same time, it shows you what's possible to achieve. And I just... It's a good trailer yeah. for Tanya right there. Like yeah. How could someone not want to learn it? I, I mean, <laughs> it's still not on the New York Times bestseller list. So apparently... You know, I heard, though, that it is in the metaverse. Have you heard that also? That's possible. I don't know. Yeah. Have you heard that? It's quite likely. I heard that Tanya is in the metaverse. It's quite likely. Someone is teaching Tanya in the metaverse. It wouldn't surprise me. That is awesome. It wouldn't surprise me because Lubavitch and Abbas always jump on stuff like that. Yeah. They should go everywhere. Yeah, sure. 
Yeah, the first shul on Mars will be a Chabad house, no question. <laughs> Amazing, no question. I hope Mashiach comes before there's a first shul on Mars. To be honest, yeah, yeah, that'll be. I don't know how far away from, we are from that, but <laughs> I would in, in your that, yeah. in your your you know eight plus years writing uh, uh, advice column for Ami Magazine, yeah, there's got to be thousands of really interesting questions that have been asked. Is there any? Yeah. Are there any that stick out, or any story from writing that column that that you have to share? Wow. You know, every one of those letters is a life. And that's how I took it. It's not just a letter. This person is writing to me. But the, 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 the letter represents everything they've been through and felt for their entire life up to this moment. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why people don't realize they were like, well, why'd you stop writing? Like, well, what's, what's the big deal? And I, I, I have told people it it took me an entire day by an entire day i mean nine ten hours to read each letter wow. forget about it. i didn't start writing yet and they weren't like multiple pages there's a word one limit. yeah <laughs> yeah like a page of a word doc and uh it, but it take me a day like eight nine ten hours to read the letter to read it I, I think that's why your column was so beloved is so beloved in your uncanny ability to look past the words of the letter and to the insight into what is going on in this writer's life. Because there's a person that brought there. them to write this letter. Well, it's like the yeah. Rebbe did. They said the Rebbe's letters were were sealed with his tears. He didn't have to yeah. lick the envelope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, by the way, they tried to get the Rebbe a, a rubber stamp for his signature. And uh, the Rebbe said people don't want a rubber stamp. They want uh, human connection. So he signed every every letter. And uh, look, I, I, I'm not going to compare myself, I, I, but, but I will, like I said before, I did rip off the style. So yeah. to whatever extent, I say the Lubavitcher Rebbe taught a mahalach. He taught a certain way. To the moon and the sun. And, and I, I, I'm not even going to go there, but I'll just say, look, the Lubavitcher Rebbe taught a certain way of doing things. And to my, to, to whatever degree, I'm able to, to learn it in my own way. So I, yes, I, I, I stole the style, like I said before. Did people like it? Yeah, they, they liked it. Did people say to me that, oh, wow, you really nailed that. I can't believe you figured that out. I can't believe you pulled out that detail that you read between the lines. Okay, yeah, talk it. But I'll tell you one thing that happened one time where I wrote, uh, okay, I got a letter. Some the, These parents are writing to me and they're saying, we don't know what to do about our daughter. She wants to get married. And we don't think she should get married because she has zero redeeming qualities. Whoa. Yeah. And then they start to say all of her defects. So I wrote back and I said, I cannot believe that parents, let alone Jewish parents, would ever say about their child that they have zero redeeming qualities qualities like even if your child really had some serious grave character defects like really serious issues you would still say we love her she's so sweet she tries but now she's got these serious issues and we can't allow her to look into shidduchim until she addresses them like right. that i would buy but the right just, just so flatly she has no redeeming qualities so I actually wrote that it's hard for me to believe that this letter was written by parents. I actually, I don't feel that this was written by parents. Wow. And I'm going to give you like the benefit of the doubt. I'll pretend I'll go along with the premise of how you're writing. But personally, I do not feel that I'm speaking to parents right now. And that's what I wrote in the, in the response. And a week later, I get an email. And the email says, you answered my letter last week. Okay, so I'm not the parents. I'm the brother. My parents wanted me to write the letter. I wrote it for them. Wow. Oh, wow. So it wasn't the parents. So Ouch. actually, I, I, then I, 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 I wanted to print that. Mm -hmm. But then they told me, no, don't print it because it looks, it looks like they fooled you. And I'm like... They didn't fool. <laughs> okay. Did they though? Okay. But it's interesting. I was, you mentioned Keshenafshi. Yeah. So I was one time uh, down at the, the, uh, the TP uh, crisis said, center. Yeah. Avi Fishoff. Yeah, with Avi Fishoff. And so one of, I've been there a few times. 
uh, but one, I think the first time I was there, so there were the, these parents there and they were really struggling, like really struggling, like with a child who was very difficult. And so they said, you know, one time you got a letter from these parents that saw no redeeming qualities and they said, well, we wouldn't go that far, but like sometimes on a really, really bad day, like we can almost relate to that. And like, so they brought up that letter and I was like, you want to know the secret, by the way? I told them, I can't believe any parents would write this. And I found out it wasn't the parents. The parents didn't write it. No parents could write it. And then I told them, I said, listen, I know you're struggling. And I know there are days where it feels like I can't handle this child. But you yourself are telling me, mm -hmm. notwithstanding all of the heartache and the, and, and, and the real pain that you're going through, that <laughs> you can't even look me in the eye and tell me that your child doesn't have redeeming qualities. You're admitting yep. that your child, yeah. as much aggravation as they're causing you, you admit that they have. I never heard it from him, but yeah. when I was in Philly Yeshiva, the, the Olam would say over from Rebellious Svei, Zechariah Levracha, that when the Gemara says, Ben Sera Moira, there's never going to be one, it's because the Torah requires that the parents bring the child right. to end, to end yeah. it, and a, a parent will always see the redeeming quality That's right. of a child. Yeah. Yeah. Robert Taub, if a movie were made about your life, <laughs> <laughs> that was really like a transition right there, right? Hard left turn. Just put an ad right before this. Yeah. <laughs> put your blinker on now? Yeah. <laughs> Fill up your blinker. New York right driver. <laughs> <laughs> if a movie was made of your life, yeah. what would the title be? Uh, it would be called Tikkun Lel Shvus. Yeah. Ah. Shabbos Agod Al Joshua. <laughs> Shabbos Agod Al Joshua. <laughs> One of those. That would be the sequel. Probably. Can I say what I think it should be? Yeah. Well, yeah. Chase. Chase? Like just Chase. One word. One word? It's a one word. It's no? powerful. Yeah. That's powerful. You know, like W? Like you know, like that bush they call W? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chase. Yeah, I like it. Okay. So if Netflix comes. Would I'll I play just... myself? Who would play you? That's a good question. That's a good question. Not Will Smith. <laughs> I don't <laughs> who, know who that is. Neither do I. No. I just saw it. <laughs> I saw it in Very a paper good. last week. Yeah. Um, who would play you? That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I hope yeah. you would. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, would, I think I would play myself. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Has that ever been done? Anyone ever played um, themselves? Yeah, but those 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 films are usually not good. Probably, you'll no. need Michael Jordan to play himself in the oh, cameo would appearance. Oh, that be too. awesome! Michael Jordan yeah. cameo as himself. Yeah, yeah. Space Jam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Space Jam. They did that, no? Yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Uh, as Bugs Bunny also played himself in Space yeah, Jam. Yeah, he did. Nice. <laughs> as you wind as, as you wind up this ep wind yeah. up this episode. I know you have to go. Yeah. Um, and we definitely need to do a part two because there's so much just we didn't get to and we need to discuss just for the <laughs> listeners, really, honestly. Leman Schlemus are in it. Yeah. Um, but you moved to the five towns, mm -hmm. which means you're, you're near the oil. Yeah. And you've been there, I, I would say, pretty frequently. Or you try to be. Are there any, like, stories or things that happen? I, I've heard oh. and I've spoken to many people that yeah. go to the oil and they experience something. Yeah. Let's, I want to end off this episode with a Misa from Rabbi Shay's Taub. If you have one. Oil story. I mean, first of all, it, it's not like I have any great stories, but thousands of people do. I mean, people go to the oil and they dive in and they they say you choice and they, yeah. they, okay. Going to the oil is a Misa. Sometimes it takes a long time for people to know their Misa. Yeah. There's always a Misa. <laughs> There's all that's right. It's always, always a Misa. And, and and I like to go there and sit there in the middle of the night, three in the morning, and you see people coming in from all backgrounds all levels of observance, all types, and, and they go in and they do their thing and then they disappear into their car and they drive away into the night. And look, people have stories, push it open, miracles. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have like that. Right. I, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you a story happened to me uh, at Dial. Um, so first of all, just for full disclosure, it's not uncommon. I hang out there often. I'm often there. And I've told people before, if you're ever going to the oil, uh, and you can let me know in advance, like 24 hours notice, I will meet anyone who wants to go. You can email rabbi at soulwords.org. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to the oil, you rabbi to at soulwords.org. Correct. Rabbi at soulwords.org. If you're going to the oil, you want somebody to meet you there. That's my honor to do so. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to facilitate that. But so I have people come over all the time who are like, Oh, we just came out of the aisle and we wrote something, a very serious thing. And now we see you. Would you would you talk it over with us? And whatever, I'll listen. I don't necessarily always have something smart to say, but I'll listen. And so that's that's not uncommon. 
But I'll tell you one time, so I, I, I was at the oil, and I, and I go there often. I don't always go into the oil. Sometimes, you know, there's a base medrash there. There are bachram who learn there full time. There are, there are minyanim there. Some, most of the time I go. It's legendary cookies. And like legendary how you do cookies. It. Yeah. During COVID, they package so, them. Yeah, now with COVID, they put them yeah. in plastics. Not the same. Bring, but, bring back the unpackaged cookies, please. Yes, they gave even the cookies a mask. So, yeah. <laughs> so sometimes I'll, sit, I'll just learn. I'll, uh, you know, uh, I'll daven. Um, and I don't even go in to the actual tzion. But um, so one time, but I, I had been in to the oil and I don't remember what I wrote about, but whatever it was, whatever was on my heart. And then I came out and it was, it was time to dab a mincha. And so I found a minion and I started dab a mincha. I'm in the middle of Shmanessa and, and a guy's staring at me. I'm in the middle of Shmanessa. There's nothing I can do. I can't like, like turn away. I can't really like. But it's it's clear the guy's staring at me, and and I'm and I'm the middle of Shmoneser, so it's not like I can like look back at him and sort of like give that yeah. eye contact check, like no, you're looking at me, like <laughs> you know. Uh, so I'm just kind of ignoring it, but it's very awkward because the guy's clearly staring at me. And finally, you know, after a few minutes, uh, step back out of Shmoneser, and the guy walks right over to me, and he says, "What's your name?" So I, I said, "Chase Taub." He's like, "That's what I thought." He says. Uh, I just came out of the aisle. He says, I'm in a very, very contentious lawsuit right now over a, my business is falling apart and I have a relative, a close relative who I'm fighting with and it's, it's ruining my life and not to mention all the money that I lost and, and, but it's really, it's ca causing discord in my family and bad blood. And he said, I watched this class of yours about resentments, about how to get over resentments. And it connected with me like nothing else connected in that way of like realizing I've got to let this thing go. Like I got to stop fighting this thing and I got to move on in life. But I needed, I, I watched the video, I watched it online. And then I said, I, but I have to talk to this guy. I have to ask him a question. So he said, I, I went into the aisle and I wrote to the Rebbe, you know, uh, whatever it is about the, uh, my, my fight that I'm having with this relative and about the business. And, and then I said, I'm asking one thing. Rebbe, work it out. I want to meet the rabbi from the video online about the, who gave the class about resentments. So he says, so I came out of the aisle now, and I see you standing here. So you know, there's a story about a Talmud of the Baal Shem Tov, who he wanted Gilu Yilio. He wanted the revelation of the prophet Elijah. And so he went to the Baal Shem Tov and he asked, how, how do you do it? So the Baal Shem Tov tells him, he says, Ed uh, Shoshana, you take a, a basket of food and buy some clothes, a box of clothes, and you go to the forest. And at the edge of the forest, there's a little cottage and there's a, a widow and her children. They live in this cottage come out of Rosh Hashanah and, and you deliver the food and you deliver the clothing for them. So uh, he follows what the Baal Shem Tov tells him to do. He delivers the stuff. And uh, after Rosh Hashanah, he comes to the Baal Shem Tov and says, where's my Gilu Elio? I'm, I'm supposed to see you know, Elijah the prophet. I didn't see anything. So the Baal Shem Tov says to him, okay, listen, Erev Yom Kippur, what I want you to do, I want you to buy some more, more food. And I want you to buy more clothes, yom tov clothes, nice clothes, children's clothes, and nice food for you know, a nice meal, and put in a basket, and we go, go out to the forest, I want you to find this little cottage where this widow lives with her, with her children, same place. I want you to bring this, these packages out of Yom Kippur. Okay, fine. So he goes to the, the forest, he finds the cottage, but this time before he goes in, he stands at the door, and he's listening, and he hears the little children crying and saying, Mommy, Yim Kippur's coming. We're going to have to fast, and we didn't eat today. What are we going to do? And the mother says to the, to the kids, Don't worry, Kindalach. The same way that Hashem sent us Eliyoha Navi out of Rosh Hashanah, wow. Hashem's going to send us Eliyoha Navi again. So wow. the guy realizes... <laughs> you wanted to see Elio Navi. <laughs> the Valshamta wanted you to be for this person. 
the the Elio Navi in their in their story. So it's like you know, you, you want your answer? No, sometimes, no. What do you want? You want to get an answer, <laughs> or you want to be the answer? <laughs> you you want a miracle to happen for you, <laughs> or you want the schus that the miracle happens through you? Wow. And you know, I I I've, I thought about that story a lot of times because in a, in a certain way. <laughs> I, I, I feel like it, it's like a theme in my life. Like, am I okay with the idea? Like, if... Am I okay with the idea that I'm, I, I'm there for somebody else's benefit? Like, even... Even my own relationship with Hashem, you know, is it about my fulfillment... Or maybe it's just a way that I can be in the right place at the right time and in some small way be of service to somebody. Like, like if not that anyone asked me, no one, no one asked me, but if they were to ask me, are you okay with being, you know, in that position? You know, what would I answer? And I, I think the answer... <laughs> I mean, with every passing day, the answer is more clear to me. That, yeah, yes, that a close friend of mine lived through a certain life experience, and he was going. He had the opportunity. He was asked to sort of speak to people that were struggling with a similar inion, and he called me and he's like, "I don't really want to do this," and I he's like, "Do I do I have to do this?" And like, "What should I do?" And just like the the thought that popped into my head was. You could have a, a very you know selfish experience and just go there and participate like everyone else, and you don't have to do this. But you could also go there and share your story and mm -hmm. impact a lot of people that can gain from your experience. And going back to what we said before, there are people who have paid the price of admission mm -hmm. to become very wise, and we need to start giving those people a platform absolutely not just going over and saying to them hey i don't judge you i don't look down on you no fuck it i look up to you i think you're amazing no actions L take action let's the from world by the way we're very good at giving people platforms mm -hmm. we know how to do it for rabbis we know how to let certain people set the agenda set the tone Tell us what we ought to be doing. We know how to do that. We're good Talmidim, which is a mile. It's a good, it's a virtuous quality to be a Talmud. Sounds like you just challenged Nachi to invite people to share their story. I am challenging While preserving yeah. anonymity. That's interesting. To invite, quote unquote, regular people, the unsung heroes who have been through real stuff. If I'm listening big, that's what I heard. here. Scoop. And while preserving their anonymity to break stigma and to show us who the real teachers and the real heroes of our community are. Well, I can't wait to see the comment section for people who are watching this on YouTube. And I think really people are going to be inspired by this and, and give their okay. two cents. But for now, we're going to have to wrap up this episode. This was really, okay. yeah, this Thank was, you. I appreciate that challenge. That's, that's deep. And hopefully we do something about it. But Rabbi Taub, um, We'll we'll plug it where people can find you in the outro to this episode. But thank you yeah, so much awesome. for, for coming you. in and spending the time with us. My pleasure. Thank you for your service. Great. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I ever want to be. Just try to be of service. Wow. Wow. That was truly a, an opportunity to sit down and hear from someone who has such has such a view into spirituality, has such a command over the language of spirituality and the challenges that this generation is experiencing. If any of that resonated with you, you know, we just, our roles here are really to empower people to introduce meaning into their life. And if you are struggling with something and maybe you need some help, maybe for mental health, maybe for addiction, whatever you might be struggling with, there are ways it's okay. There are resources and uh, we'll maybe list a few of them in the show notes. We definitely want to thank Rabbi Chase Tao for coming on this program because that was a lot of wisdom wow. that he shared. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to leave us some feedback, leave a review, rate five stars. And we're, we are totally 
committed to bringing you more content and more guests like this one and to have the conversations that maybe should be had more as always thank you stay classy <laughs> have a good one